Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Wildfong, and this is our presentation on how to keep your local seed collection sustainable. This is a talk for people who are familiar with seed saving and have a collection of seeds that they would like to keep for the long term. It might be a community seed library. It might be a personal collection. Maybe you think someday you might like to start a seed company. So you're starting to bulk up a collection of seeds. For whatever reason you have a seed collection, the important thing is to keep it sustainable so that the seeds are alive and they grow into what you want them to grow into. And that's what we'll talk about in this session. So Seeds of Diversity is a, a seed saving organization. We're an organization of gardeners all across Canada who save seeds. And the reason we do that is to uh, preserve the varieties that um, are, are being grown in backyards all across the country. We'll see a little bit later uh, what that looks like. But first, here's a little quiz. Which of these four pictures is not a high quality seed collection? At the top left, we have the famous Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's an underground vault full of seeds. You've heard about it. It's uh, on a remote island uh, near the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's it's uh, part of Norway. And um, what they did is they dug a, a mine shaft into the side of a mountain and they keep seeds there very, very cold, very dry. And it essentially functions as a backup for seed banks all around the world. At the top right, we have the interior of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Rows and rows of shelves with rows and rows of boxes all full of samples of seeds. At the bottom left, we have a shot from the Plant Gene Resources Canada Seed Bank, which is Agriculture Canada's seed bank. It's located in uh, Saskatoon uh, at the Univers University of Saskatchewan. There's a, a great big room uh, under one of the campus buildings, which is uh, essentially a, a giant freezer. They keep the seeds at minus 20 degrees. Uh, the seeds that are in this collection are, are very well dried and they should last for decades. They have 100,000 samples of seeds there. And at the bottom right is Paul with a box of seeds. Which of these is not a high quality seed collection? And the answer is, well, it's a trick question. They're all high quality seed collections. The fact is the size of your seed collection doesn't matter and the technology that you have doesn't matter. What matters is whether you are treating the seeds properly so that they remain viable and so that they grow into the plants that you want them to grow into. Because those are the things that we really want. When we have a collection of seeds, we need the seeds to be healthy, which just means they'll grow. We want the seeds to be true to type, which means they'll grow into the plants we expect. We want our seed collection to have a sustainable scale. Very often people make collections of seeds that are just bigger than they can manage. And what happens is that the seeds age faster than they can be replaced. And eventually you wind up with a collection of dead seeds. So we'll talk about how to figure out what is the right sustainable scale for you so that you have the right size of collection. And maybe it's just a box of seeds like Paul, but the quality is there and that's what matters. And finally, we'll talk about how to keep your collection well organized. If you can't find your seeds in your collection, then it's not a very useful collection. So we'll talk about that too. Now, backing up a little bit, why are we keeping a seed collection? Uh, seeds of Diversity's answer to that is to preserve uh, seed varieties that are not being perpetuated by any other way. If you imagine this circle on the screen, these are all the seeds that existed 100 years ago. Tragically, during the past century, one quarter of that is all we have left. Three quarters of all the seed diversity that existed 100 years ago is gone. It, it disappeared because people didn't grow those varieties. We used to have lots of seed savers. People used to save their own seeds for their own gardens and their own farms, at least a lot more than today. And without those people growing their own varieties, their own seeds on their own land, and instead fewer and fewer and fewer people supplying seeds, fewer varieties were grown and we have a lot fewer left. Worse, worse than that is the little green triangle. That's just one eighth of what's left. And that's the amount that's available in seed catalogs. The other seven eighths is still around, but only in tiny quantities and you can't buy it anywhere. So it's in seed banks, it's in seed collections. 
we need to make sure that we preserve that seven eighths of our of our remaining seed diversity really well. And that's really, that's what Seeds of Diversity is trying to do. And that's what this talk is really all about. So making your seeds last for the short term and the long term. The key is to keep seeds dry. If they're dry, then the little plant that's inside each seed kind of hibernates. It goes to sleep. And every seed has a little bit of stored up food. It's just like a bird inside an egg. It's alive and it has some food and it has to eat that food to stay alive. So the key for making a seed last a long time is to make it eat its food slower. You do that by keeping it dry because then it hibernates, eats its food slower, the food lasts longer and the seed lasts longer. Um, temperature also matters. So if you can keep the seed cold, then that causes the seed to hibernate a little bit further and it eats its food slower so it lasts longer. If you, um, if you can't get both dry and cold at the same time, then make sure you keep your seeds dry. And most importantly, right after harvest, keep your seeds in a, an open kind of container, let them breathe to the air. It's, it's essential when freshly harvested seeds, and even if they're a few months after harvest, uh, they can't be put into a closed up container because there's still too much moisture inside the seed. If you put freshly harvested beans or freshly harvested uh, pumpkin seeds or any kind of seeds in a, a glass jar or a plastic bag, the next time you look at it, they'll be moldy. They have to breathe for at least three months before they're dry enough to put into a sealed container. Now, if you're only going to keep your seeds for a year or two, if you intend to plant your seeds next year or even you know two years from now, it's completely fine to keep them at room temperature. Keep them dry, but room temperature is just fine. Most seeds will last for a year or two without any special uh, freezing or chilling, just as long as they're dry. When we want our seeds to last longer than that, it's good to keep them cold, cold and dry. So what I do after the seeds have had three months to dry out, I put them in uh, sealed containers. It could be glass jars, it could be uh, plastic containers, but I'll tell you, that plastic containers allow more water vapor to get through than glass does. Glass jars are really good. And inside a glass jar, if the air is dry, then it stays dry, regardless of where the jar is. So you can put a jar of seeds in a cold, humid place. As long as the air inside the jar is dry, it doesn't matter if the location is humid. So for example, a cold basement. A uh, basement at my house is pretty cool, but pretty humid. A fridge is cold, obviously, but fridges are also really wet. If you, next time you open your fridge, just feel the surfaces inside and you'll notice how, how humid it is inside a fridge. It's a terrible place to put seeds because it's so wet and so humid. But inside a glass jar, if the air is dry, then the seeds can stay dry and cold. If you wanted to keep your seeds much longer, long-term storage, 10 years, 20 years, just like those uh, seed vaults we saw earlier. They, they manage that by keeping the seeds frozen. And if your seeds are fully dry, then they can be frozen. By fully dry, I mean they have to be dried out in nice dry air for at least, at least three months, maybe a little bit longer, but we'll talk about how to ensure that they're fully dry before freezing. There are a little, uh, little bits of water, little, little microscopic amounts of water inside the seeds. And uh, you know what happens to water when it freezes, it crystallizes. So imagine if your seeds weren't completely dry, they had a little bit of water inside. And when they froze, the water turned into crystals and the crystals would be sharp and pointy and damage the tissues inside the seeds. That's, that's why we have to have the seeds completely dry when we freeze them. So I've said dry and cold is the recipe for keeping seeds to last for a long time. This is what actually happens. This chart shows the loss of germination of two samples of seeds. One is stored in a humid warm place and the other stored in a dry cold place. And this is an actual chart. I believe it's for barley. This is, this is an actual experiment that was done. So the, the line on the horizontal shows the time in years and the line on the vertical shows the germination rate. Our two samples of seeds start out pretty close to 100% germination at year zero. 
but then the, the warm and humid seeds, they lose all their germination power after just two years. Whereas the dry and cold seeds, they last for quite a lot longer by about year eight or nine, they're down to 50%. And by year 13, they're down to about 10% and it falls off from there. That's still pretty good, still having half of the seeds alive after eight or nine years. And the only difference is that one is kept dry and the other one is, is uh, kept in a humid and warm place. The germination rate tends to fall off slowly at first. See how that gray line starts off kind of horizontal and then it gradually slopes down and then falls off faster and faster once it gets down to about 60 or 50%. So what we'll see is in the first, first few years, just a little bit of a loss of germination. And then in the next few years, a little bit more loss of germination. But once it gets down to about 50% germination, we know that the rate is falling very quickly. So if you have a collection of seeds and you test your seeds for germination, you find that they're at about 70 or 80%, then I would say they're still good for a little while. Test them again in a few years. If the germination rate falls down to 50 or 60% though, then you can expect that that rate will, will drop very quickly in the next few years. So even though it seems like half your seeds are still good, they won't be very long. So it's time to regrow them at about 50 or 60%. That's where they drop off really fast. We use glass jars uh, and not plastic containers. The reason is <clears throat> plastic containers um, seem like they're watertight, but really plastic has microscopic pores that allow little molecules of water to get through. Um, plastic, it looks kind of like a sponge under a microscope with lots of little holes and it uh, it's, solid enough that it doesn't allow actual water to pass through, but it does allow humidity to get through. Glass, on the other hand, is, is completely a barrier for water vapor. As long as the lid is really well sealed and you can check the rubber on the lid to make sure that it's nice and new, then the seeds inside a glass jar will be perfectly uh, protected from any humidity outside the jar. Glass jars come in a variety of uh, shapes and sizes. We have six different sizes of jars and we, uh, we use them for different quantities and different types of seeds so that we can pack our seeds efficiently. They're inexpensive, easy to find. Uh, we think these just ordinary glass jam jars and pickle jars are an ideal storage container for seeds. When we freeze seeds, and remember, we freeze seeds when we want to preserve them for a, a very long time, like 10 years or 20 years. If you don't need to keep your seeds for 20 years, then there's no reason to freeze them. Keep them dry and cool, ideally in glass jars so that they stay dry. But if you want your seeds to last a really long time and you have some freezer space, here's how we do this. We have a, an ordinary plastic bin. And on the bottom of that bin, you see something white. That's silica gel. We buy it at craft stores and it's normally sold for drying flowers. It's a material that absorbs moisture. So when you put flowers uh, in a box with, a, with silica gel, the silica gel absorbs moisture out of the flowers, dries them quickly so they maintain their color. It also works for seeds. We can put the, the jars on top of the silica gel with the lids open. Then we stretch a, a plastic bag over top and seal it pretty well. And after three days, the silica gel will have dried out the air inside the bin and the air inside the jars and dried the seeds sufficiently that they can be frozen, three days. Now, if you're really good, and I'm not, if you're really good at this, you can close the jars without even taking the plastic off. You can kind of manipulate the, the lids right through the plastic. Uh, and we've had, we've had some people, uh, Paul, who was in that first picture, he was good at it. Uh, you can also just sort of reach underneath and quickly put the, the lids on. That, that won't be a problem. And then the silica gel, has absorbed moisture, it doesn't do that forever. Once it's absorbed moisture, it won't absorb anymore. Usually it has a kind of a, an indicator. Often there are blue crystals in there. Uh, they're blue when, when they're dry and they lose the blue color when they're moist and they've absorbed too much moisture. What you do is you put this uh, silica gel material, it's really just little glass beads. It's very, very durable stuff. You can put it on a, a baking sheet 
in a, an oven on a really low setting, lowest you can get. And that just dehydrates the silica gel, recharges it so it can dry uh, your seeds again. And you can use it over and over again. There's no limit to how often you can reuse it. So that's how we store seeds, dry and cold, or dry if you can't make them dry and cold. Now, what about keeping our seeds true to type? If we're maintaining a seed collection and we want our seeds in the future to grow into the thing that we, that we expect them to, that they used to grow into, we have to take some uh, precautions. Now, if you're uh, familiar with seed saving, then you know all about isolation. What we will say though for a seed collection is that we need higher standards for isolation than, uh, than even seed companies might. Look at the little um, flow chart on the bottom here. This is what happens in a seed company. A good seed company will have its own source of seeds that it uses to grow its seeds year after year. And then it has the seeds, we call the market seeds, that they sell to their customers. Now, customers expect a high quality of seed. They want their seeds to be um, you know, all true to type. And the commercial standards in Canada tend to be about 99.8% that we expect our seeds to be that, that good that only 0.2% of a, a batch of seeds can be an off type to, uh, to, to qualify under typical Canadian standards. It's different for every kind of crop, but that's kind of the average. But that's if you're selling the seed to be planted and grown and not to be a source of more seeds. If you were using the seeds to make more seeds and then using those seeds to make more seeds and using those seeds to make more seeds, which is what the seed company does internally, it would have to be a much higher standard of uniformity because any amount of off type, any amount of crossing or any, any amount of, of, uh, of difference in each generation would just add up. Generation after generation, the seeds would become less and less uniform. So they have to keep their stock seeds, they call it, their internal supply of seeds at a much higher standard. And that means a much better isolation. In a seed collection where you have some rare varieties, perhaps that you can't get anywhere and you have to grow your own seeds, you must do the same thing. You have to keep your seeds at a higher standard than what you would expect even in commercial seeds in a seed package, okay? So for example, for tomatoes, we often say that a small isolation distance is sufficient, something like five meters. That's often true, but for, uh, for seeds that you're trying to preserve and you're trying to grow your own supply of seeds, that which will be your supply of seeds for the next generation and the next generation, well, we suggest that a higher uh, isolation even than that is, is important. 15 meters for tomatoes is a, uh, a, a very good isolation for tomatoes. Six meters for beans. For squash, it, it becomes uh, much more of a challenge. We will talk about how to manage some of those things. Let's say you do get some crossing into your uh, tomatoes or your squash or your beans. Um, this is an example of cabbage where I grew lots and lots of, of, uh, of this cabbage, and I noticed one of them was different, different than the others. Now, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how it crossed in some previous generation. I'm generally very careful with isolation, but I have had crosses happen. I've had crosses happen with tomatoes, which are not supposed to happen. I've had crosses happen with beans, which are very, very rare. But these things do happen. So, a really good tool for a seed saver and a seed collector is what's called roguing. It means looking through all of your plants and do this at the seedling stage and at the transplant stage, at the, the leaf, flower, fruit, and even the seed stage and look for any that are not the same as the others. Any differences, anything that, that is possibly the result of a, of a cross pollination last year, just remove it. Remove it so you don't save seeds from that plant. And if possible, ideally, do it before they flower so that that plant doesn't cross with the others in the same row. Easily done with cabbage because it flowers the following year. Um, it's easily done with lettuce. You could look through a row of lettuce and find the, the uh, lettuces that aren't quite like the others. Eat those and save seeds from the rest. A little more difficult to do with squash. 
you can't necessarily see the differences until the squash is already flowered. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to do with tomatoes because you can't see the differences until the tomatoes have flowered and set fruit. Um, but with tomatoes, at least they're self-pollinating. So by saving seeds only from the tomatoes, the, the, the ripe tomatoes that are most true to type, that's a good way to get rid of a lot of the off types that might have crept in. That keeps your seed supply as uniform as possible. Um, and like I said, you can see these kinds of differences even at the seedling stage, even at the transplant stage. Um, look at the height, look at the, the shape of the leaves, look at the, the growth habit, all sorts of things that aren't necessarily connected with the produce, but they do indicate that the plant is a little different from the rest. We talk about pollen population size more and more. I think in um, seed saving lessons of the past, we never talked about pollination, or sorry, about population size. Uh, and that is something that we do need to talk about. What it means is that for every seed crop, you should be saving seeds from a minimum number of plants. Not just from one plant, not just from two plants, but from quite a few, as many as you can really. But the minimum, uh, for instance, for um, for self-pollinating inbreeding crops like tomato, bean, and lettuce, it's it's really helpful if you can save seeds from at least 10 to 20 plants. That's a challenge with tomatoes for some people for having 10 or 20 plants of the same variety. That might be too much uh, to fit your space. It's not difficult with beans to get seeds from at least 10 or 20 plants, and it's it's not that hard to do with lettuce. Lettuce is fairly compact. To get 10 lettuce plants per seed, you can do that. For uh, um, outcrossing or cross-pollinating species, it's a little bit more difficult because those tend to need more, uh, more plants. You tend to need something like 40 or 80. For very outcrossing plants like onions and corn, that means that they pollinate very freely, very widely. You need many, many more. Uh, why? Why why do um, self-pollinating plants not need so much population? Why do cross-pollinating plants need more population? And the answer is that the, um, the difficulty comes in uh, two, two cases. One is that plants and animals, for that matter, can be inbred if they are crossing with fewer individuals. Uh, animals and most plants are not accustomed to inbreeding. They're used to spreading their genes around among a big population. And so the results of inbreeding um, don't really tend to happen as long as that big population is there. With um, self-pollinating plants like tomatoes and beans, they inbreed all the time. They're self-pollinating. They, they, they don't even involve other plants. They pollinate themselves. And so inbreeding has kind of uh, not it, not, not that it was never a problem, but since they became more self-pollinating under cultivation, the, uh, the, the, the problems that are associated with inbreeding kind of got weeded out of, of those plants. The situation is that in every group of plants and animals, there are some genes that are kind of broken. They didn't, um, they didn't transcribe properly. They uh, don't function. And the problem is that if those genes accumulate too much together, then that can cause problems for an individual. That's what's called inbreeding. Simply plants that naturally inbreed like self-pollinating plants, those broken genes have already been kind of discarded from the population. And uh, those genes are still circulating among outcrossing plants. Another reason for population size is you're carefully roguing. You're looking at the seedlings. You're looking at the, um, the flowers and the fruit and see all the parts of the plant to, to look for all the characteristics that make that plant uh, uniform and or make the variety uniform. So you're only saving seeds from the lettuce that has the right shape and the right color and the right flavor and the right, right height. But what about things you can't see? A row of lettuce, even if they're all the same shape, color, size, uh, flavor, some of them will be more resistant to mildew than others. 
And you can see that in a mildew year, but you can't see it in a dry year. Maybe some will have uh, drought tolerance and others don't. And you can see that in a dry year, but you can't see it if they're being irrigated or if it's a nice rainy year. Don't save seeds from just one lettuce plant because maybe there's some drought resistant gene that's in another plant and you should be trying to capture that gene, but you don't know it's there. You don't know which plant that's in. If you save seeds from just one or two lettuce plants, maybe there's a disease resistance gene somewhere in the other plants and you're losing it by only taking seeds from a few. If you take seeds from all of the lettuce plants that you can, then you're more likely to catch all of those good beneficial characteristics that you just can't see. And that's, that's the lesson. Just when you look at a row of plants and they all look alike, just imagine that you can really only see something like one tenth of the actual characteristics of that plant. You can't see that some of them have stronger root systems than others. And you can't see that some of them are more, are more resistant to things like sun scald. Um, the only way that you can capture the whole full beneficial diversity of that variety is to collect seeds from lots of plants and, uh, and then mix those seeds together. So that's why population size. And it's something we haven't talked about very much in the past. It's something we need to talk about because when we, uh, when we don't, um, when we only collect seed from uh, one or two individuals, we really change the variety. We lose a lot of good things from that variety. So we talked about how to keep your seeds healthy so they grow and how to keep them true to tight so they grow into what you expect. Now, what about your seed collection? How do you keep it sustainable? Remember back the population size. We don't actually count seeds in our seed collection. We count populations. So if we think that a, a, a lettuce variety, uh, the population size for lettuce is 20. You need 20 plants to, to grow uh, a good population of lettuce. Well, we would want to have enough seeds to supply 20 growers for rejuvenating that variety. We want to keep in, in reserve enough seeds to supply 20 growers so that we can regrow that variety when we have to. That means for that particular crop, 20 seeds makes a population. So 20 seeds times 20 populations is 400 seeds. That's not that much. We only need to keep 400 seeds of each lettuce variety in order to supply enough for 20 people to grow them back out again. And when we have more than that, and remember we're collecting seeds from as many plants as we can, so we always have more. Well, we share those seeds with seed exchanges and seed libraries, and uh, we try to get those seeds out to as many people as possible. I'm only talking about what we keep in the collection for preserving the variety in the, in the future. We also have to think about what happens when those seeds in our collection lose their viability. What if they get down to only 50%? Then in order to grow 20 plants, we'll need 40 seeds. So if that's what we expect, then the math is a little bit different. We say we need to keep 40 seeds so that when they reach 50% germination, we can grow 20 plants and we wanna multiply that by 20 growers. So really we need 800 seeds and that's what we keep. This tells us how much lettuce seed we should keep. It tells us how much bean seed, how much tomato seed, how much squash seed we should keep. And uh, we look at a population chart and do a little bit of math to figure out how big that is. Turns out it's not that big and we can keep a, a pretty uh, good sized collection uh, in not very much space because 400 lettuce seeds, it really doesn't take that much space. How do we know? how good our seeds are. Well, there's no rule of thumb. There's no way to tell whether seeds are good or not good just by how old they are or the way they look. The only way to tell is to germinate. Try them out, see if they grow. If they're in the 80 to 90% germination range, then they're good for a long time, as long as they're dry. If they're in the 60 to 70% germination range, then they're still good for a few more years. And if they're into the 50%, 60% germination, then it's about time to grow them back out again. Now, a commercial seed company will test 400 seeds in a germination test. And the reason is that they want to print on the envelope, and you've probably seen this, germination tested at 96%.
how do they know it's 96% and not 97% or 95%? The reason is to get that accuracy, you have to test 400 seeds. But I just said that to maintain 20 populations of lettuce seed, I wanna keep a total of 400 seeds. How can I do a huge 400 seed germination test when I'm only keeping 400 seeds of each variety in the first place? And the answer to that is we don't need to know exactly the germination rate. I don't need to know if it's 96% or 95%. I just need to know, is it kind of around 80%? Is it kind of around 60 or 70? Or is it getting down to kind of around 40 to 50 to 60? And within those ranges, within that, that tolerance, I don't, I don't need to test more, more than 10 or 20 seeds. 10 or 20 seeds is enough to give a sense of, are these seeds still good, almost ready to be grown out again, or no, they need to be grown out. And so that actually works really well because it means we don't have to use up a lot of seeds for germination tests. Um, if I only need 10 or 20 to give a, uh, an indication every few years, I can take that out of my 400 uh, lettuce seeds and really not lose very much. It's also much easier to, to uh, keep track of, it takes a lot less time to count. Uh, I'm grateful that 10 seeds is good enough, but if you need an accurate germination rate, um, obviously, Testing 10 seeds won't give you an accurate rate. It just gives you a, a kind of an idea. So now how many varieties can we regrow? That's important to consider. If you have room for four kinds of tomatoes and four kinds of beans and four kinds of lettuce, then you can calculate how many varieties in your collection you can regrow every year. Maybe you have room for 10 of each. Maybe you only have room for one of each. Maybe you have some friends who can help you out. If you have a whole community involved in your seed library, then figure out how many varieties you can regrow, figure out how many years those varieties will last. And then the math is just a simple, how many varieties you can regrow every year times how many years between grow outs, which is based on how your seed storage is. If your seed storage is very good, each, uh, each of your samples of seeds might last for many years. If, uh, you, if your seed storage is just at room temperature, you might have to regrow them more often. If you're giving away seed quite frequently, then you might have to regrow more, more often. If you're keeping the seed and not giving it away often, then they might last longer. So there's, there's no rule of thumb. You have to figure that out. But multiply, how many varieties can you regrow in a year times how many years do you have to regrow them? And so for example, let's say you're able to regrow six tomato varieties every year and you know that your tomato seeds last for about eight years between regrowing. So you're going to regrow six tomato varieties this year, six tomato varieties next year, six tomato varieties in the third year, and after eight years you will have grown out 48 different kinds. And then you'll have to start over because it'll be eight years since the first batch. That means you can have 48 varieties of tomatoes in your seed collection. See, it's, a, it's simple, simple math to figure that out. Do the same thing with beans, do the same thing with squash, do the same thing with all the different kinds of seeds that are in your collection and figure out what size of collection you can actually handle. Because if you can't keep up with regrowing the seeds, if you can't keep up with, with uh, uh, getting fresh seeds in to replace the old ones, then your seeds will lose germination over time. Your whole collection will become more and more uh, dead seeds and fewer live seeds. And you don't want to make a great seed collection and then find out 10 years down the road that you couldn't keep, you couldn't keep it up. It turns out to be a lot easier to make a seed collection than it is to keep it alive. Right now I could just buy in seeds order in seeds, I could make a collection of a thousand different kinds of seeds if I wanted to spend the money. But could I look after that? What would that collection look like 10 years from now? Can I keep it still as viable 10 years from now as it is today? Well, probably not. So if I had a seed collection at home, which I do, it should be in the scale, the number of varieties that I can actually maintain over the time frame that that is necessary to regrow them. Quality is what matters. Remember the first slide when we talked about the the, the great big 
International Seed Vault versus Paul and his box of seeds, I wanted to make the point that Paul's little seed collection was just as high quality as that international seed collection, just a different size, but it's the quality that matters. So this is what we uh, want to talk about the most when we talk about seed collections. Keep up the quality and uh, you'll be grateful in the future that you have good seeds. Finally, how do we organize these? When you have a small collection of seeds, just a, a hundred different kinds, you could put them in a box like Paul. And if you want to find some seeds, just go through with your fingers and find them. But we find that when we have more than about a hundred, it starts to get pretty time consuming looking through all these boxes to try to find them. So at Seeds of Diversity, this is what we do. We have about 7,000 samples of seeds now in our collection. Um, and we have uh, our, our favorite seed storage containers, just these mason jars. They come in six different sizes and we have letters for them, A through F. The, uh, the boxes are numbered. So there's A1, A2, A3, those are the small ones. There's F1, F2, F3, those are the big ones. And then each jar has a, a letter. So the jars have a letter on the top of the lid, A, B, C, up to L, because there are 12 jars in every box. So I can, if, I, if I know I need seeds that are in B2, that's box B2, jar C, I can look on the shelf and find box B2, open it up, pull out jar C, and there are my seeds. This is how we organize them. Every uh, seed sample, every package of seeds or every, uh, every sample of seeds that's in a, in a jar has a number on it. So when I open up the, um, uh, the jar and pull out an envelope of seeds, that envelope will have a number. The number is also on uh, a, a spreadsheet or a database. So I have all this information at my fingertips and um, we want to record, this is useful to record this no matter how large or how small your seed collection is, this is the kind of information that's really useful. The variety name, obviously, we want to know what's in that envelope. We also want to know how old it is. Is it from 2012, like my tomatoes, or is it more brand new from last year, like my beans? That will give you a, an idea of, of uh, uh, whether it might be time to look at whether it needs a germination test or not. Um, we want to know where it came from. We want to know how much we have, because if you're filtering through with your fingers and looking at the seeds in the box, you can tell how much you have. But if the seeds are in jars, in boxes on a shelf, it's harder to see how much you have. It's nice to record that so you get an idea of, do I have lots of beans, 155 grams, that's, that's plenty, or do I only have a few left? If I only had five grams of beans left, that's hardly any beans. I would know that I need to grow those and I don't have enough to share. The germination rate is really important too because it tells you how to manage your collection. I know from, from this that my beans are in good shape because they have 100% germination. My wheat is in good shape because it had a test about a year and a half ago at 95%, so it should still be pretty good. But my tomatoes were at 70% back in 2018, that's three years ago. So I better pull those out, do another germination test and see how they're doing. And if they've fallen below 70%, I should probably grow them out this year. Whereas my cabbage, I got that in 2018 and I never did a germination test. I better do one. So that's how we keep our seeds healthy. We keep them true to type. We figure out that how to make a, a collection that's a sustainable size so that we maintain that quality in the future. And uh, that's how we organize our seed collection so we can find the, uh, the seeds when we want them. And we also know what's in our collection and we know things about it like the germination rate. There's one more thing, really it probably should have gone first, but I put it at the end so that it might be the thing you remember most. When you make a seed collection, the first thing you should really figure out is what's it for? All too often people make seed collections because it seems like a cool thing to do. And later on down the road, they decide that they should have done it a little differently. Well, think about it from the very beginning. What's your goal? What's your purpose? Because that will define how you make your collection, how you manage it, maybe the scale, maybe the, the way that you present it to your community, the way that you involve other people. 
is it just for you? Are you making a seed collection just because it's, it's, it's of seeds that are interesting to you and you want to keep those varieties? I have my own collection. Of course, I manage Seeds of Diversity's collection, but I have my own at home and it's just probably about 10 or, or 12 varieties that I like and I grow them in my garden. But I manage those varieties because they're special to me and then some of them I can't get any place else. It's just this little, little private collection. I manage it completely differently than Seeds of Diversity's because it's a different kind of collection. Maybe you have a community garden. Maybe you want to involve people. Well, that will change the whole structure of how things are done when you have a, a group of people working together. Or maybe you're thinking that you'd like to start a seed company someday and you're amassing a collection of seeds that will be the foundation for that company. Quality will be the main thing that you have to do right and you have to learn how to do that right because when you're running a seed company the quality will matter more than anything maybe you just want to save the world hey if you want to save the world with seeds i congratulate you and thank you on behalf of the world because that's what seeds of diversity is trying to do too um that that uh really kind of brings together a lot of uh all the purposes of, of uh, why we save seeds why we got interested in saving seeds in the first place and uh, you could probably do all of all of these uh, uh, all, all of these purposes all together in one way or another but do think about why you're doing uh, what you're doing before you get started I, I completely advise because uh, so many people start off um, without really thinking that through and then they set up something which they wind up wanting to change later on there's lots more information to be found uh, the two websites here uh, seedsecurity.ca is the website of the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. It's a, an agency that has uh, existed for uh, close to 10 years, which is uh, dedicated to improving the quality, quantity, and diversity of seeds in Canada. There are lots of resources there that will help you um, in managing a seed collection or starting a seed company. And seeds.ca is Seeds of Diversity's website. You'll find lots of information there about other webinars like this about Seedy Saturday events, our seed exchange, our seed collection, and um, just general information on how to save seeds. So I thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Have a good day.